Hello and welcome to the CEO Show. This is your host Nick Badia. And why should you watch this video? Because our guest, Ruth Saunders, specialty is in dealing with board members at corporations worldwide and opening their minds to new ideas. That is a pretty challenging task, as you all know. Yet what she has learned is remarkable and our conversation here is illuminating. She has over 25 years of experience in marketing and brand strategy. She has worked across a range of B2C and B2B companies, including FMCG, financial services, telecommunication, retail, media, and the list goes on and on. Her past roles include McKinsey, Procter & Gamble, Saatchi & Saatchi, amongst others. Typically, her work focuses on branding and particularly on brand migration. Currently, she is the founder and managing partner of Galleon Blue and On Point, where she helps clients develop, get boards buy-in to implement innovative marketing strategies. Her latest book is Marketing in the Boardroom, Winning the Hearts and Minds of the Board. So ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you, Ruth Saunders. So Ruth, thank you for joining me on the CEO show. And I'm glad that you could make the time. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. So now, what I, I did notice your background, and obviously I had to, to get into the details of it, but uh, you're from McKinsey, you work with Procter & Gamble. You've done marketing research. I understand you also have a background in statistics. So you're the you know traditional, not the traditional, but the, the new age the quantitative marketing scientists, if I may say so. Is that right? No, I would say actually I'm not. So um, I, I'm very much an arty mathematician. I did a stats degree and lots of maths in it, and I loved uh, doing that. And my bent is really maths and psychology. So I love looking at human behavior. So I have that lovely mix of, of art and maths, which so often is not recognized. And I started out in market research for four years at Mars and Procter and & Gamble. And then I went into marketing and learned how to run a brand for four and a half years at Procter & Gamble in, in classic brand management. And then I went to uh, advertising for five years. I was at Saatchi in a company called Mustos and I learned how to be an advertising planner. And then I was very lucky to get headhunted over into McKinsey and I became a marketing and branding generalist doing CEO level consulting work. And at that time, that was the bit where I had done all the elements of marketing and branding, market research, um, the marketing of leading a brand, the advertising of bringing it to life creatively, and then how to fix CEO issues in the marketing and branding space. And so in, in essence, I became all well-rounded. And uh, since then, I have focused on marketing in the boardroom and helping board uh, members with marketing and branding issues. That's very, very interesting. And, and also, if I may tell you, my background is similar. I did my doctoral work in psychometrics, which is psychology and mathematics. <laughs> and uh, I've been in consulting. I was with McKenna Group, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with Regis McKenna, long time ago. So did some strategy work there. I was with Dell. I, I was actually an advisor to the, to the chairman's strategy team and uh, did a lot of technical stuff, did some marketing research, uh, worked for Razorfish. Uh, which is a new age of advertising. So to some extent, I think there's, there's a bunch of commonality between what you do. And then I started working with CEOs because I really got tired doing segmentation for large corporations where you create a massive little, uh, you know, massive folder with all kinds of details and all the logic to change people's minds. And then the minds don't change. And the folder goes and sits somewhere on a desk after spending half a million dollars. Yes. So that's... that's so I do the bit, which is the board papers, the board conversations to try and bring the recommendations to life and uh, have the compelling fact base to support it and essentially make change in the organization. So I do a bit of the what, it, what should the strategy be uh, and then get buy in across the organization and with the top team to make it happen. I think that's that's really, really the important part that we, we're going to be talking about. Uh, you know, creating a compelling argument or compelling program or compelling plan is one thing and getting the buy-in of the people involved, stakeholders, is a completely different thing and, and both are equally important. I mean, if one doesn't happen, the other doesn't happen. Uh, exactly. You know, so, so the logic and, and the facts and the figures, whether it's, you know, quantitative sciences or it is, you know, the, the Nike stuff, which is, you know, doing hypnotic things and crazy uh, qualitative research, whatever they do, but no, no matter how you do it, the buy-in has to happen. And especially when you're talking about something that, um, shall we say, 
emotionally powerful concepts such as what's a segment, what's a message, what's a baby, as I think you've mentioned someplace, you know, that's when it gets tricky. Yes. Emotional conversations can get quite tricky. Right. And I think often a lot of the stuff I do is around more emotional stuff. Uh, I find brand migration one of the most emotional subjects uh, because people feel they're going to lose their power base if they change to the mother country's brand. And I've done quite a lot of brand migration work where you're going into local countries and saying, we may need to, we may need to change your brand. How do you feel about that? And obviously that's not something they want to do. Tell, tell me a little bit more about what is brand migration. Brand migration is when you change a brand name from one to another. Um, so uh, it could be in the UK, we've changed Marathon to Snickers. Uh, so now the, the chocolate bar is called Snickers here in line with the US. Um, so it, it's when you change a name because you want global scale or because the name um, is no longer appropriate or in those kind of situations. Very common in M&A situations. Right, m and and also when you go global uh, or glo global, so you move into another country, I don't remember what was the name of the car, I think Pinto in, in Mexico, which, which meant doesn't go. Uh, I don't know <laughs> which car that was. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So we, I worked, I was very privileged to work on the brand migration of um, Norwich Union to Aviva. And it was the case, it's an insurance company here. Uh, it's a global company, it's in the States. And uh, I think it was the only case we could find of the mother country changing its name. And the reason it had to change its name was because they couldn't use the word Norwich around the world because people can't say it. Uh, so it's a very English name. And so they used the Aviva name around the world, and then they had 23 countries with the name Aviva, and they had three countries without, and one of them was another country. So it's quite scary to take the decision of changing the name of 50% of your business to the um, Aviva brand name. So, so, so this, is, this is great. Uh, as I was reading some of your work, you know, the idea came to me, well, it's, it's fundamental in, in the concept that you're driving, but the, the terminology that I'm using is instead of uh, persuading, you instead of persuasion, you do procreation. And I want to dwell more into it. Uh, and, and what I'm saying essentially is that instead of, instead of persuading people, instead of, instead of negotiating with them to, to an end result, somehow you procreate or rather co-create and, and come up with a concept that they already have bought into because it's theirs. And that's fundamental to sales. Instead of selling, you actually let them create what they want to buy. And that's the concept you have been driving at. So I want to go a little bit more in depth into it because, you know, like you said, this is, this is, uh, this is very, very personal. It's, it's like, you know, uh, convincing your date to, to go steady with you kind of thing. You know, that, that's, that's more really emotional stuff. Exactly. And so, what is it about the, the conversations that you have to have where you are not negotiating? First of all, you probably don't have that negotiating power. Even if you had, it's just a hard thing to do. So give us some ideas about that. So the, um, I worked out that I had a process sometime, sometime ago, about 2009, 2010. And the process uh, I worked, I developed um, just by accident really, um, and I found it worked well, was the following. So first of all, at the start of a project, I write down what I think the hypothesis is on the solution. And it's a one page hypothesis. It's probably 75% correct. And I do it in the first couple of weeks. And then um, I go around and talk to each board member individually with the hypothesis there and say, what do you think? Is this right? Is this wrong? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have any data to support it or not support it? Tell me. And in that meeting, I normally take 30 minutes with them. In that meeting, I get their, their views and I might get some, yes, I support, or no, I block, or no, I don't care. And I've certainly had, I remember one situation, a person said, you know, I don't agree with this. And I said, why? And he gave me a reason, which was it will damage my business. And I said, if we can prove it won't damage your business, would you be happy? And he went, sure. And that gave us, we then had six weeks to do market research to prove it wasn't going to damage his business, and he bought into it. 
So up front, we're understanding their issues and then looking at what's the fact base that we can build to either negate those issues or what can we do to create a solution that, that go, goes around those issues so that they don't suffer. Um, we then you know, build the fact base, build the story, get it to the, where it needs to be, and then go back and show each of the board members again. And Is it more like a Delphi method where you go back and forth, back and forth? Uh, usually I'll just do two meetings with each board member and some of them it will just be one if they're happy and they don't want to be involved then we just do the one. Um, but if they, if they uh, have any issues or concerns then I'll typically go back again and show them where we're at. And then at that stage I hope to get their buy-in. If I don't then we work a bit more with them until we get to the board meeting. And ideally on the, in the board meeting what you want is for the recommendation to all already have been agreed so that actually you show it in the board meeting and, and everyone goes, yeah sure I'm signed up. No problem at all and the meeting's done and i certainly now have seen situations where that's happened so basically it's you know you, know, you don't surprise them in the meeting itself by then you've already had the buy-in from each individually and you go back and forth between board members or the stakeholders to make sure that everybody is under the same page yes and it's really helpful for the board members because uh, firstly they get time to get used to the idea and so to sit with it for a while Secondly, they, have, uh, they can ask questions, raise concerns, and we can listen and try and work with them. And thirdly, they have time then to talk to their peers. Do their peers agree with them? Do they disagree with them? I had a situation where um, one board member disagreed violently, and we had quite a tough meeting. And afterwards, we realized that he was a lone voice, and so he let it go, the battle went away. And so it gives them time to check out what everybody else thinks. Yeah, I, I call this barbecuing because you can't really nuke it, you can't microwave it, you've got to get them, the, as you said, the time to, use, uh, time to get used to the idea. You can't just jump in and say it is so logical, it is so sensible that your emotions and feelings don't matter because you know, emotions work in a different way. You've got to get them the time to get the system down and change. You can't just go and say logic, perfect, makes sense, why are you being stubborn or adamant about it? Exactly. And I was really struck um, by a conversation I had with one board member. Um, often when I ask to see board members, they don't want to see me, they're busy, they're frantic, they've got other things to think about. And so I have to kind of negotiate my way into their diary with a bit of, you know, carrot and stick going on. And um, the, I think this guy gave me 15 minutes in his, in his office. So I went and saw him and I had a really good conversation with him about brand and it was about brand migration. And um, at the end of the meeting, it was really good. He gave me 45 minutes. At the end of the meeting, I said, would you like me to come back? And he goes, sure, Ruth. And I was like, you said that you didn't want to talk about this. And he goes, Ruth, everybody comes here and all they do is sell to me. You've come here and asked my opinion. I can't remember the last time I had a conversation like that. That is wonderful. Now, this is such an incredible uh, insight. It's like, it's like it makes absolute common sense that, you know, when you're trying to sell to someone, you want to know what they want. But unfortunately, we behave in a completely contrary way. And whether it's the board member or trying to sell to the executive team, any idea that people try to sell, they will spend what I call the, the Procter and Gamble way, which is, you know, you do research for eons and then create a concept and you try to sell. But what people forget is that you didn't do the research to begin with in, in the current environment because, uh, you know, the, the really the people you're selling to have, hadn't heard of this before. So you have really no idea what these people whom you are selling to, whether it's the uh, VP of uh, you know, uh, marketing or CIO or whomever you are selling, whatever you're selling to, uh, you haven't worked through. So they, and I've heard this, this same concept before that you know, people just try to pitch in and when they try to sell in, I've got these gatekeepers and I run and hide. I don't want to listen to you. <laughs> and exactly. you know, exactly. so you're right, you're right. And, and, you know, people don't recognize, and which is what I, one of the things I wanted to get at, is whether it's a board member or the executive team, same level. They have constraints on their time like nobody else does. And so to sell to the, you know, top level, you've got to have a very different approach. And since you talk about board members and they sort of epitomize the kind of people you're talking about, tell me what's so special about them. So exactly what you've said in terms of they are very time starved and so they want you to come to the point immediately. So um, often people don't really know the context of why they're talking, they don't really know what they're really asking for and so I do quite a lot of training work and teach people that first of all you go in and say 
we are here to decide this is why it's important for the business this is what i want your recommendations to are, are you happy and being very clear about what you want agreed and when you're coming to the when you're coming to it you, you need to get to the point very quickly because they're very time starved and and they don't have time to waste and then as part of that um i would then ask them questions what do you think do you agree do you disagree and that then get them to talk to me about their views but if you don't go in with that open of i'm not here to waste your time this is very important and it's really key that you engage on this is why you should engage on this then they will just dismiss you quickly and a lot of people make that mistake so so it's very important to actually have an upfront understanding of uh, you know what is the level of interest and understanding on the CXO's part or the board member's part, and then be able to draw, their, draw them into the conversation. I would say more, um, why should they be engaged? What's in it for them? What's, why is this important to the business? And opening with that so that if they think they shouldn't engage, then they can assess again. Maybe they don't need to, maybe it doesn't affect them, maybe they do need to. But being very clear about, you know, I'm here, and uh, I'm here, you know, in a sense, doing you a favor and doing the company a favor, um, by uh, showing you this because I think you need to engage in it and you can say no that's fine but you know maybe you should okay so so this takes me to the next level you know when it is all logical sensible you get to the point quickly and they see you are here to actually help otherwise you'll get out of the way exactly. that's wonderful but what if what you're proposing is antithetical to their very being for example I'll give you an example of uh, Ford Motors Ford Motors um, 19 whatever 20s when they said you know all american needs is black ford model t and for 16 years he he did not put the color uh, any color on his cars and lost 60 percent of the market share that's the story Amazing. a huge big thing and I, I think research would very easily have shown him yeah this makes no sense his partners his family his associates everybody said you need to put color on the cars look you're losing market share and he didn't he didn't Agree is the wrong word. He just refused to see. Have you gotten into a situation similar to that? And how do you handle once you get there? And he says, yeah, this is important. I understand, but I'm not listening to you. Uh, yes. So I've, I've got lots of situations like that. So the, the, what I have learned over time is that um, often there is an issue uh, and it's a material issue and it's a big issue, but the company isn't quite ready to deal with it yet. For whatever reason, be it that they've got other projects on, they don't have the resources, there are other fires they're trying to fight, whatever it is, uh, the timing is not right. And I have seen, I call it the elephant in the cage, I've seen people rattle that cage trying to get the elephant to wake up, and the elephant kind of wakes up a bit, and then it it's not, doesn't have the stamina to stir properly and throw itself around. And then there comes a time, and it can take two or three years, when something happens that means that now is the right time to tackle this issue. And so I always kind of say, you've got to be respectful to the decisions that CEOs and boards make because they know stuff that we don't know and that we can't know. And so the timing may not be right. And therefore we should respect that. That's one version of it. And then there are other versions where actually, well, I know that I have seen CEOs and boards make the wrong decision, but again, um, often you just have to respect that. Uh, and it's interesting that they're not hurting enough because of it. Uh, there are maybe it could be they are hurting, but there are other issues hurting more. Okay, okay, got that. So, so you have to be really open-minded. You can't go with the idea that I'm going to persuade this person. Exactly, and um, I've seen situations so often. Um, big issues are um, tackled when a new CEO comes on board. Uh, so somebody fresh who's willing to take the challenge. Uh, I worked in a situation recently where um, they were looking at building a global brand. The previous CEO didn't want to do it because he knew it would cost money. The new CEO came in and went, yeah, I'm willing to take that on. I'm happy to do it. And he breathed life into that. And that's not atypical. It's, uh, you know, that it's just timing. So in a certain sense, everything is not negotiable because you don't have all the visibility. Exactly. And um, also... Uh, people have got to want to do it. It's got to be them wanting to do it. If not, it's not going to happen. It also has to be pragmatic. Now, do you go to them when you're not really clear, like you mentioned the hypotheses and, and you, know, you know, certain times you just know that you've got to change from A to B. You know, that's a negotiation. It's just either A or B. You can't do anything else. 
but other times you don't know what you want to change it to and you're open to the ideas. So exactly. what is the difference between the two? So I, I try and go and talk to them early on because that's when I am open. Um, if I go all the way down the project and we've got a solution that 95% of people bought into and then I go to somebody who goes, you're completely wrong, I'm going to want to bash them into a corner. You know, I'm not going to want to um, uh, change what I'm doing because I've got 95% of people in agreement. So the, the ideal is to go to people early on when you're kind of like 65% there and then kind of say, so what do you think? And let them shape it with you and co-create it as you said right at the beginning. And that tends to work a lot more successfully because you get to something that everyone can buy into um, and every, something that everybody feels is, is pragmatic and tangible, feasible. So, so, so really, in a sense that uh, you may know where you want to go, but even then you follow the process of getting these people to buy in early on. Yeah, because even if you know the strategic direction, you may not know the path that you're going to follow. So even if you know, look, we're going to migrate to one brand, and we know we're going to do that, how we do it is still a big question. Right. How, when, phasing, etc. You know, I'm going through a negotiation at home right now. I want to move myself from Austin to another city, and I can't just jump up and say, hey, kids, let's, let's go. And so, you know, you've got to do that slow and process where you give them options and let them feel like they're making a decision, even though I know where I want to go. Uh, but you, you've got to get their, them to buy in and be excited about it. Exactly. And I have a, a, something I've learned over time, which I think is a great thing to know. And I've found many clients not knowing this. Um, I found it very useful. So the trick is that it takes, in my experience, three meetings to get people on board. The first meeting, um, even in brand migration situations where it's very extreme, you have this kind of, um, no, I don't want to do this, go away. The second meeting is kind of like, oh, you're here again, somebody's supporting you. And the third meeting is, oh, this could open up lots of opportunities for me, great. And that's where you get the buy-in. And I've seen that happen a number of times, and so many people think they can um, sell to somebody or convince somebody in one meeting, whereas if it really is emotional, I, in my experience, it takes three. And then that takes some pressure off if you know you've got three meetings. And this is so important, so critical, because a lot of salespeople tend to believe that, that we can just go in, this is a no-brainer, this is a great idea, we go in and we sell it, sell and come back. But you don't realize that the mind works differently. You, you know, I call it, you gotta barbecue the thing, you gotta let it simmer, you gotta let it sit for a while, you know, before you get it done. And so you shouldn't expect anything to be done in the first meeting, just make sure you plan, that you know the first meeting, second meeting, and third meeting. You don't want to go in and say, within this first meeting, I'm going to get it done. And exactly. so that process is important to have. Exactly. And then you also don't want to leave the first meeting to right to the end of the project when you don't have the room to negotiate around the second meeting and the third meeting. You're not open to what people are saying. So right. important to do it early on so that you when you are open. Right, absolutely. This is wonderful. Such a wonderful conversation. Glad to hear of your experiences and ideas. Uh, I think uh, the, the audience would really love to hear some of these things because, you know, while they seem commonsensical, they really are not. In hindsight, this may be, but in truth, these are some basic ideas that people don't have. Exactly. Exactly. Um, people don't, people say to me, um, you're saying the obvious, but actually we don't do it day to day. Yeah, I, I personally have a, a detest people who say this is 101. Well, I, you know, one one is the most important. And, and if you don't have the one one right, what's the point in knowing something if, if you're not able to implement it? So it's, it's like, you know, practice of knowledge is pretty worthless. It's the, it's the, it's the practicing of knowledge that, that matters. And so you've got to put it to action, otherwise it's useless. Exactly. exactly. Knowing is not, not good enough. So Ruth, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it very much.